Introducing Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY on the OTCQB AMY ZF and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit recyclico.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. Welcome back to the show and Happy New Year. Happy New Year, and it's great to be on your show again. Hilliard, what's the outlook for Canadian real estate in the new year? Well, the latest numbers just came out and they showed a decline in, in Toronto of uh, 20% roughly uh, year over year and a decline in Vancouver of 10%, I believe. So uh, now the, the thing that's skewing the numbers in uh, Toronto is uh, the suburbs have come down quite a bit more than that, some of them uh, substantially more. Uh, and uh, so it's a, it's a, I think we'll see... A continuation of that trend. I don't think the correction that we've had so far is nearly enough to restore affordability. It's been it's been probably a decade since we've really had affordability for the first time buyer, and we need to get uh, back to that. and And higher interest rates are are working their magic slowly. Um, uh, but uh, the thing that uh, actually is is maybe not noticeable in that story is that the um, the CREA, the Canadian Real Estate Association, which puts out house price index, has decided in their wisdom to exclude expensive homes from the index. So, so, what? so the, the decline, the decline is actually substantially more than the numbers that you'll see reported in the media because, uh, they decided to exclude the very properties that are the ones that decline the most. So if you've got a $5 million home and you can't sell it and you're, the bank's after you and the other lenders are after you, you sell it for three million, which is a forty percent decline. They're decided to exclude those those uh, items from the index. So, so just remember when you're watching these things that uh, the decline is understated. It's actually a little bit worse than what they're saying. And the other thing that's holding back the um, adjustment, uh, the necessary adjustment, is the fact that sellers are still uh, kind of buried to a certain price, whether it be a a price that the neighbor's house sold for uh, two years ago or whether it's a price that they feel that they spent on the money, including the renovation, the big renovation they did. Or uh, or in in some cases, it could be the um, what the city assessment says their house is worth, which, of course, is like a year and a half out of date as well. So so it's hard for sellers to get their head around the idea of, of, of having to list their house at a, at a, at a much lower price than than what they uh, what they expected when they first started the process of thinking about selling. Hmm. Well, in BC, the the assessments of your property have come out, and those assessments are the value of the homes on your block in July. Well, what have prices done since July? They've all come down. So you're being taxed on uh, a home value that doesn't exist anymore. Should you appeal that assessment? Yeah, I think you could appeal it and uh, probably be successful. Uh, um, and of course, the thing that the other thing that's really uh, a problem in this in this, uh, this unusual situation we're in, coming off the end of a bubble with the bursting of the bubble underway, is that uh, is that the the um, the lack of trade. So, they, like the base, the way the city assesses the value of a house is they look at similar properties that have sold in the you know whatever the previous period was the average property, but in some cases, you don't have very many sales at all to to uh, to look at. So, so the uh, it's really hard to get a true. Uh, we, yeah, in fact, I go I go out on a limb here and say we'll never know the full story because um, the you know, first of all, the CRA is excluding expensive homes as we just talked about a minute ago. But but also, there's all kinds of special situations like foreclosures and that and, and if they're listed on the MLS a foreclosure will be recorded and of course those usually tend to be 
prices that are much lower. But there are foreclosures that sell uh, without going through the MLS. So uh, they don't ever get counted. And those prices would be probably show a, a larger drop in, in, in sales. But but it's a messy process. And the thing is, the big the big thing is, the buyers have, have already realized that uh, the prices are lower and they're coming down. So they're not in a hurry to bid up the prices. Uh, but the sellers are slow to get to that realization because they've kind of invested. So in some cases, their retirement kind of depends on it. That they were going to get a certain price for first for their home when they went finally decided to make the move, and um, the adjustment process to realizing that they're not going to get anywhere near that price is a difficult one. And it takes people time to get around to that uh, that view. Some some people never will. They'll take their house off the market and they'll just they'll just not sell it because they refuse to sell below their anchor price. When we see a decline in home prices, how long does it take for it to hit bottom and then? How long does it take to crawl out of that valley? So the um, so the U.S. is the recent, the only recent uh, evidence that we have a comparable, and it peaked in 2006. The house price index uh, in, in there's really no national index, but uh, there are some people that keep track of it. Robert Schiller at Yale University is, is one really good uh, source, uh, and uh, it, 2006 was the peak. 2010 was the bottom, so four years. And what's interesting about that is, uh, and this may happen again or it may not, I don't know, um, there were a whole bunch of homes that were brought by, bought by hedge funds, uh, like Wall Street speculators, basically. At some point in, um, in 2008, 2009, 2010, I'm not sure exactly when, there are some very large numbers of homes that were bought, uh, taken off the market. And those homes have been, um, basically in the rental pool ever since. So, um, and that turned out to be a pretty good deal for them. They bought uh, low, and now that they've sold. Yeah, so I think most of them have not sold yet. So, uh, but that 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 stopped the process of getting even worse. Than it's going to get so uh, kind of put a floor on the, on the market. But it took four years to get to it, even with the of those hedge funds stepping in. And uh, in uh, in this situation in Canada, it's a little different. We don't have those big Wall Street hedge funds waiting to pounce on the lower prices. And of course, the prices are much, much higher. So uh, the, the hedge funds wouldn't be addressed yet. They'd have to, the prices would have to come down quite a bit more. So I would think it's going to take. Uh, I, and also, given that our bubble is so much bigger, I would, I would think that it was it would take um, it would take just as long for years. So uh, the peak allegedly was March of 2022. Uh, that's what I read this morning when the A numbers. So. Uh, coming up to one year. Only three more years to go, Jim. Wow. So uh, interest rates, that's uh, also very key for buyers. People at variable rate mortgages could have seen their monthly payments go up $1,000, 1500 Yeah, the uh, Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, they all started to raise interest rates uh, about a year ago, I guess. And uh, They've raised the rates four percent, roughly, on this average, from zero to I guess the Fed. The Fed's the best one to watch: four point three to four point five percent current range, and they had been zero to zero and a quarter percent. So four percentage points. Um, a lot of the people in the um, in the markets in Wall Street and Bay Street were thinking that uh, the Fed is just about done because she started to come down a little bit, and, and the inflation is the key thing that the the, the central bankers are watching. Um, but then uh, the the minutes came out uh, yesterday of the December meeting when the Federal Reserve raised rates, and the commentary was, "No, we have to keep raising rates until this inflation thing is is, is uh, right back under control." Well, inflation was seven or eight percent, and the target is two percent, so it's nowhere near under control if you take that measure. Um, and I think a lot of people were caught uh, off guard by that, so the markets are having a rough week right now. Uh, because people were, were kind of starting to price in the idea that uh, Federal Reserve might hike one more time and then they'd be done. Um, and also that they would start to bring rates down quickly. Um, I think that it's more likely to be like 1980 to 82. I think you and I have talked about this before, uh, where they had to uh, keep raising rates for a number of years. And, uh, and, uh, there were two recessions. Um, what, what, uh, what people don't really expect this time, and this could be wrong, 
is that they uh, don't expect the, high, the Fed to keep hiking rates uh, into a recession. Uh, but it looks like uh, maybe they will, and this would be a big change in behavior. The, only, the last time they did that was in 1980 to 82, when they had we had two recessions. 1980 was the first one. 1982 was the second one, and the Federal Reserve kept interest rate, hiking interest rates all the way up through that. So, and the reason they did that, they didn't want to do it, but the reason they felt they had to do it was inflation was very persistent. Inflation was very once inflation gets embedded in the psyche of uh, businesses and 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 wage earners. Um, it's really hard to break the back of inflation. And, and the, the second, um, certainly the business people were very quick to raise rates, to raise uh, prices, I mean, uh, in response to inflation. And some people are calling it greedflation. Um, but the wage earners are just getting started with their demands. And um, they're, they're now even further behind. Already, before this inflationary burst started, they were already well behind because the wage earners had not had increases that had kept pace with inflation for the last 20 years. Mm. Now they're so far behind and they're really upset and there's a generally a shortage of workers around so uh so look for more demands by wage earners for some fairly large increases which will keep the fed hiking rates as be my prediction at least for the first half of 2023 or perhaps for for, for the whole of 2023 before they start to cut um, now all of that would be off the table if there was a severe recession, obviously the Federal Reserve would, would reconsider if we had a, a very severe recession. Uh, but other, outside of a severe recession, I think the, you can expect the Federal Reserve to keep keep the rates high and even keep hiking them a little further. Do you think we're going to see a wave of strikes this year? The UK has just been hammered by strikes, but then they had energy prices more than double in some cases. And the nurses there say their wages are 34% below inflation. Yeah, the last time we had, uh, inflation above, you know, above 10%, we're not quite there yet, but we're close. Um, the, uh, the unions were much stronger in the society. There were, there were a the much bigger percentage of workers were unionized back in the late 70s, early 80s. And, uh, there were massive strikes. Uh, you know, people were, were, uh, very, uh, militant about getting wage increases. This, this time around, um, the unions have lost a lot of power. And uh, most of the unions now are more in the government workers, like the health healthcare workers, and and that sort of thing. And yes, we I think we will see the the, the strikes. And I'm sure they're already happening. I don't think they're getting the attention that um, they would have normally gotten because there just aren't as many uh, unionized labor forces as there used to be. But uh, yeah, there aren't as many gonna... reporters either who would report on stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the uh, but. And the other thing is, if, there, if there's no union and there's no uh, way to collectively bargain for these wages, people are, are doing this thing they call quietly quitting. They're just they just say, "Oh, I'm not working for this wage. I'm going to going to stay home, not come to work, or I'm going to quit." And uh, and uh, that is uh, that is a protest, I guess, of a sort. It's not a collective protest; it's an individual protest. But uh, business people are finding uh, find workers, uh, and maybe they need to pay them a lot more than they have been. Also, I think that would make the labor situation different in a recession as we had uh, a big labor shortage going into it. And there's also a huge wave of retirements at the same time as well. Yeah, if there's if there's a bunch of people on the sidelines, and the, but they're older people, uh, a recession may not bring them back from um, from uh, from retirement. Uh, you know, the, the, the younger people that are are. are in a normal recession, would come back to work quickly because they're, you know, they need work. But to older people are retired. They, they, uh, they, you know, recession may not be may not be enough to get them to come back. So it might be a longer term problem to get these people more interested in in working and may require uh, higher wages. Or, or uh, and of course, businesses are are making big strides in in finding ways to to run businesses with fewer workers as well. So. But I mean, the, the announcement this week of Amazon laying off eighteen thousand people—pretty significant announcement. And what uh, what doesn't get reported is smaller. You know, there's a I forget what it is, but the threshold is maybe two hundred people below which um, businesses are not required to report their layoffs. So there's there's probably a bunch of layoffs we're not hearing about in the ten twenty uh, employees uh, category. So it's a it's a moving situation, but the 
is that the higher interest rates, uh, which is you know, the key factor here, inflation and higher interest rates are, are forcing a slowdown. And that's what the Federal Reserve and the central banks want to do. They want to, they want to weaken demand. It costs people to maybe think about maybe keeping their money in a GIC rather than spending it to get inflation and control. And that's a messy process that will for sure will require at least one recession. And uh, and the question is, are the markets prepared for it? I, I don't think markets have corrected enough, whether it be the housing market or the stock market, uh, to allow for this, for this process to, uh, to be fully incorporated in prices yet. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, what's uh, the situation in the sovereign state of Alberta? Well, you know, we had the, uh, the the start of the new government under Daniel Smith and the sovereign bill number one, the Sovereignty Act, and that seems to have faded away. There's, uh, she quickly had to backpedal. There were some mistakes made, and of course, the oil and gas. Uh, so that you know, we don't expect to hear much more from that for a while. I think the the uh, the, uh, uh, the fight with the federal government that was being talked about won't happen uh but the oil and gas is feeling pretty good they had a great year last year the you know we know that the toronto stock market was only down eight percent and the u.s stock market was down 20 percent and the big difference there was the was the oil and gas sector the energy sector in canada being so so heavily weighted in the index um in the u.s the energy uh sector of the 11 sectors was the sector that was positive for the year all the other sectors were negative. And of course, the big ones like uh, Tesla and Apple, they came down quite a bit. Google, Amazon, uh, we don't have any of those, who, or we have very few of those in Canada. So we didn't have the big te- technical stocks correcting. Um, in the case of Tesla, it was 70%. And some of the other ones, of course, none of the other ones were that much, but there were pretty substantial corrections there. So the NASDAQ was down 30%. So you can see that... Uh, um, that uh, that the tech sector was the was a big weight on the market. So Alberta's you know kind of insulated from a lot of that. We don't we don't feel in Alberta that uh, much of that applies to us. As long as the oil and gas business is going along well, then the, it's all good. And uh, the price of oil has come down from a hundred dollars down to about in the seventies somewhere. Um, so that's still pretty high. That's still plenty high enough to to give uh, Alberta producers a good profit. Um, the, so uh, there isn't a big crisis looming in Alberta right now, but longer, of course, if uh, the climate change people have their way, um, fossil fuel production is going to be limited and eventually completely uh, stopped, and Alberta will be heavily impacted by that. But most people in Alberta feel that that's at least 30, 40 years away. Well, also, uh, there are things right now, jet engines don't run on sunshine for some reason. Uh, you know, big ships probably will still be using petroleum products, pharmaceuticals, plastics, all those things. But burning it in your passenger car, probably, yeah, a fading trend over time. Now, you're a Tesla owner. What's your take on what's going to happen to Tesla? Are they going to go out of business? If I don't think, yeah, no, they're not going to go out of business. The, the uh, conversion to electric cars is... is it's well underway, and you know, outside of the U.S., it's much more advanced than it is in the in the U.S. It's up to five percent electric or something like that. Uh, yeah, in China, like twenty, thirty percent, and in parts of Europe, it's that high as well. So, so uh, but it has happened, and um, it's quite a significant impact because uh, there's a hundred million sold a year. So Tesla, I think, at the end of the year, there was a disappointment. Um, I think they were looking at um, 1.3 million cars sold, uh, and they're expecting a little bit better than that. Um, the uh, for for uh, 2023 is two million cars by Tesla, and a substantially larger number from competitors uh, in total uh, because a lot of the new new offerings from companies like uh, Kia and and uh, even Ford. Ford has got two big offerings: the Mach Mach E, like the Mustang. They call it Mustang. It's not really like a Mustang, but that's what they call it. 
And the big one is the Ford F-150 Lightning, which is an all-electric version of their pickup truck. Um, they seem to be doing surprisingly well, even though the, yeah, there's a long wait if you put your, your order down. So once they get ramped up with production, their sales will improve directly. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, the, the, uh, so if, if let's say 10 years from now, it's 50 million electric vehicles, Tesla's going to have a, a share of that. They're, they're hoping to have, uh, a substantial share in the 10 to 20 million unit range. And, uh, there isn't, that much that could stop them, other than maybe Elon Musk's eccentric uh, political uh, Twitter uh, excursions that he's causing people to uh, turn against, perhaps. But but other than that, the the company's in, in great shape. They've got a big head start, and they're the history of uh, when companies have head starts like that. You think of Google and the search engine and Amazon and the online delivery. They generally keep that they keep their position their dominant position that's why people try so hard to become to get into that position because it carries a lot of, of momentum for many many decades after once you establish that uh, like Microsoft go back to 1980 they, they think about Microsoft they had a terrible product in my opinion and uh, they never lost their position even though they you know they they basically it was 95 uh, all those different versions that everybody hated people kept buying them. They, they, you know, it didn't. So, you know, uh, Tesla's got a really big head start and uh, got some really big advantages. And the big thing that uh, people don't realize is, um, I don't think they give a. I, 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 let's say they don't credit to is the knowledge in the company about how to manufacture cars. It's it's like manufacturing electric cars is a whole new version versus uh, the the older legacy autos. And um, the only company uh, really that has substantial um, you know, uh, brain power in terms of how to do it is, is Tesla. There, there will be other companies. BYD out of China is starting to uh, do extremely well, and uh, there's some Korean offerings, uh, Hyundai and Kia, that look like they're coming on pretty strong as well. And Volkswagen will eventually get there. You know, Volkswagen is making 10 million uh, ICE cars a year. Um, they're not anywhere near 1 million even right now in, in electric, but they'll, I think eventually they'll get there. And uh, so there's going to be lots of offerings and uh, electric cars will be adopted by the general public as soon as the, they can get their hands on something that they like uh, for a reasonable price. Hmm. Now, in the rest of North America, maybe uh, Tesla is still a, a curiosity. In Vancouver, we're the Tesla capital of North America. You see a lot of them. Yeah, I actually had the experience, uh, I was coming back from, uh, a ski trip to the mountain. Oh, it was an incredible ski trip. It was minus 30 most of the time I was there. They don't, the lifts don't open until, uh, the price, uh, the, the, uh, temperature comes below, uh, minus 30. So some mornings we had to wait till 10, 11 a.m. for, to get out on the slopes. Anyway, I was coming back and, uh, of course, electric cars, as everybody knows, have to be charged more frequently when it's really cold like that. They can lose as much as 50, uh, the extreme percent of their range, but they've, for sure they lose 30, 40 percent of their range. So instead of stopping once between Lake Louise and Edmonton, I, I had to stop, uh, three times. Um, uh, and, uh, I got to the one near Calgary and, uh, there was a lineup and I had to wait 20 minutes. <laughs> that was quite, quite a, quite a long wait. Um, to get my turn to charge, you know, so it's, uh, uh, they need to get more chargers. So they're going to need to build a lot more, and, and they are building a lot more chargers very quickly. But, uh, but, um, yeah, even in Alberta where it, uh, electric car adoption is, is not that strong compared to BC, of course, um, but they're going to have to build a lot more charging stations and, and they're fairly easy. I mean, they don't, it's not really building, it's just installing a, a post and a cable and a little device and and and, and hook into some uh, power. Um, I guess eventually uh, the power systems might need to be upgraded if there's enough electric cars getting charged that they're starting to put a strain on the grid. And uh, of course, that could be a bottleneck as well. There's lots of stuff happening. Uh, they're getting more and more popular with uh, many many people. Uh, and uh, once people find out how much fun it is to drive an electric car, they'll become even more popular than they are now. It's one thing I noticed when I drove an electric car, pedestrians stepping in front of me because they didn't hear it coming and they didn't look. Do you think they're yeah. eventually going to have to put a motor-like sound on your electric car, like a speaker in the grill, so people can hear you coming? Because a lot of pedestrians listen. They don't look. 
Yeah, uh, of course, a lot of pedestrians have uh, their earbuds in there. Yeah. Because, and now they've got their toques on top of their earbuds. So they, even if there was a noise, maybe they wouldn't hear it. So, yeah, uh, there's going to be uh, certainly going to be some changes in that respect. I don't know if they – they have built it into the car now. I noticed in the latest software update that you could generate a noise uh, – Hmm. Uh, as you're driving, but I haven't, I haven't uh, turned that option on yet, but it is, it is built into the car. Hilliard, anything else we should be keeping a close eye on right now? Well, keep your eye on inflation. That's the number one thing because that affects what the central banks have to do about interest rates. And then that affects the price of housing and the price of stocks. So uh, the number one thing to watch is inflation and all. And uh, people can also subscribe to my weekend note, which comes out on Friday. Just find me on Twitter at HMACBE and then uh, sign up for the uh, weekend note and I'll come to your email address. It's uh, Right now it's free and um, we cover all these topics in a written form at that time. Hilliard, thank you so much for chatting with us and all the best here in the new year. Yeah, it'll be an exciting year, Jim. Uh, it'll be interesting. <laughs> 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 My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth. His website MacbethMcCloudPartners.com. If you have any questions for Hilliard or any of our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.